from the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center and Understanding Evolution, this is the Evolution in the News story for October 2009. I'm Kristen Jenkins. Evolutionary biology is an inherently interdisciplinary science. In particular, evolutionary biology and geology research are closely linked disciplines. In this month's Evolution in the News, we look at evolution on Madagascar, and the geologic history that made it possible. Madagascar is the world's fourth largest island, roughly the size of France, located 300 miles off the eastern coast of Africa. But what's really interesting about Madagascar is its unique biodiversity. Not only does Madagascar harbor strikingly high levels of biodiversity, over 80% of the organisms on Madagascar are found nowhere else on Earth. To understand what makes Madagascar's biology unique, we look to the evolutionary history of Madagascar. And to understand the evolutionary history, it's necessary to understand the geologic history of the island. So where did all of Madagascar's species come from? Dr. Ann Yoder, professor of biology and evolutionary anthropology at Duke University, is the director of the Duke Lemur Center. She talked with us about her research on Madagascar, and specifically lemurs, which are found only on Madagascar. So would you tell us a little bit about uh, the research that you do? Sure. Um, I study Madagascar, essentially, um, and it all started with lemurs. I got fascinated by lemurs, and from lemurs I learned about Madagascar. And Madagascar is an absolutely fascinating place biogeographically because it's been isolated for so very long. So my research involves uh, sequencing DNA and using DNA as sort of a, a proxy for history. So by examining the DNA and analyzing the DNA, we learn something about evolution and history and time and what happened when, and you know, we try to infer from that how. Would you tell us a little bit about Madagascar itself? So what, what makes it so interesting for evolutionary biologists? Well, I mean, first off, if, you know, anybody that went to Madagascar, I mean, you wouldn't have to know anything about biology or evolution or history or anything. Um, you would go there and you would realize very quickly that almost every plant and animal there is something you've never seen anywhere else. So to be in Madagascar and be in the forest is amazing because you can look and you say, yes, that's a tree. But that's about as far as you can get, you know, it's a tree you've never seen. You can see a bird and you can go, I know that's a bird, but it's not a bird you've ever seen. You can see a mammal. And you can say, that's a mammal, and I think it might be a carnivore, but it's not one that you've ever seen. So it's just spectacular in its diversity and in the uniqueness of both the animals and the plants. So that's what you see just right off the bat. That's the surface layer. But when you look back in time for explanations of why it's like that, that's when it gets really exciting, and that's where biogeography comes in. Um, we can use geological models, um, and so we depend a lot on geologists and climatologists to tell us what happened, you know, way back in the past. And it turns out that 200 million years ago, the whole Earth, all of the land on Earth was in one big continent supercontinent called Pangaea. And about 180 million years ago, the northern continents started to split from the southern continents. So we have Laurasia, and we have Gondwana in the south. And so Madagascar was part of Gondwana. The very next thing that happened was Madagascar started to split from Africa. At that point, it stayed connected to India for a long time, about 30 to 40 million years. And then India broke off and, you know, hightails it across the Indian Ocean to slam into Asia, build the Himalayas, etc. And Madagascar just stays right there by itself in the middle of the Indian Ocean for that whole period of time. So to put those two things together, we understand then that much of the reason why everything is so unusual in Madagascar is that it has been isolated for so very long. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the difference between vicariance and dispersal. Mm -hmm. And when you're trying to decide how organisms came 
to uh, a location, how you decide if that's vicariance or dispersion? Well, so vicariance and dispersal, that is, I mean, for me, both, both mechanisms operate and both are necessary to explain all the organisms that we see on the planet and where they exist. But you can actually test for one versus the other. Um, so just to define vicariance for you, um, vicariance means that, like when I was talking about Pangaea splitting up in Madagascar and India and so on, if you had vicariance biogeography, if lemurs were the were the outcome of vicariance biogeography, it would mean that they were already on Madagascar when it separated from Africa and from India, so that they were just kind of left behind when these other land masses separated. Dispersal is the opposite, meaning that Madagascar is already sitting out in the ocean and lemurs came from elsewhere. And from what my research has shown, they came probably from Africa, and they would have had to have somehow gotten across this big water barrier that separates Madagascar from Africa. So, and it's hard, you know, from there you're, you're kind of stuck because you, you didn't observe it. You, it's virtually impossible to go back and say exactly how it happens, but what you can say is you know it's not vicariance because it's much too young. So we know that Madagascar has been sitting out there by itself for 88 million years, but lemurs, and by every method that we've used using comparative DNA analysis, shows us that lemurs at the very oldest are 60 million years old, which is very old. But still, Madagascar has been out in the Indian Ocean all by itself for you know, almost 30 million years by the time lemurs began their diversification. So we can say with pretty utter certainty that it wasn't vicariance. Ergo, it has to be dispersal. Now how that dispersal happens is a matter of speculation. Since you're the director of the Duke Lemur Center, um, I'd like to focus a little bit on lemurs. Mm -hmm. So um, could you talk a little bit about the relationship between lemurs and early primates and what we learn about primates in general from studying lemurs? Sure. Um, well, lemurs are um, a good chunk of the primate family tree. You know, so we, we talk about phylogenies, but really what it is is like a, a family tree. Um, so we can think about you know, the very, very first primate and when that would have existed and what it would have looked like and what it could do and how it behaved and you know all of anything you might want to know about that first primate and over time the primates have radiated and at this point what we have is sort of like on one half of the primate family tree we have the lemurs and their close relatives the lorises and the galagos or the bush babies um, that are primarily in Africa. And on the other half of the primate family tree, we have monkeys, apes, and humans, and tarsiers are in there somewhere, and we're, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out where the tarsiers belong. Um, so when you identify a trait in lemurs that is also found in monkeys, apes, or humans, then you know that that was true of the ancestral primate. So we've learned something about what that sort of primordial primate looked like or how smart it was or how it lived and how it locomoted. Um, so the, these are the kinds of studies that we do a lot of here at the Duke Lemur Center where we are looking at how smart are lemurs, um, you know, um, how do they metabolize, uh, what do their genes look like, how do they behave. Um, all of these things, and when we find these similarities that in lemurs that are repeated in monkeys, apes, and humans, then we know that the ancestral or earliest primates had these characteristics. And one thing that we've learned um, just in the past, say, five years, is that the earliest primates were a lot smarter than we thought because lemurs, it turns out, are pretty clever. Um, and we've done a lot of cognitive tests of uh, you know, how they count and um, can they ordinate and can they reason um, that A, you know, if A comes before B and B comes before C and C becomes before D, can they reason that B then comes before D? And the answer is yes. So we now know that the ancestral primate, for whatever reason, was able to do these kind of complex, higher level, you know, cognitive tasks. So that's just an example. And certainly for genetics, you know, it's just a gold mine. 
genetics and genomics. We always ask the scientists we interview to share how they became scientists or what they enjoy about their work. Dr. Yoder shared her childhood interest in science and how she became hooked on lemurs. And the other thing I remember was I collected a bunch of newly hatched toads once. And I mean, I probably collected a hundred of them and I put them in a bag and I brought them home and I conducted an experiment and I wanted to see if they, <laughs> so I put some water in my parents' bathtub, but just a little bit. And so I put the toads in the tub and my question that I was asking was, you know, will the toads want to be in the water or will they prefer the dry part of the tub? And then I forgot <laughs> that I'd put the toads in there. And about an hour later, I heard my mother screaming, Ann Yoder, come here this minute. And I, you know, by then the toads were all over their bathroom and she made me collect every single one and take it back, much to my sadness because they were so cool. Um, but yeah, so that's, you know, I just always was that kind of kid, you know, messing around studying organisms. And then when I really knew that my life was going to be focused on a career in science was when I came here to the Duke Lemur Center as an undergraduate. I was an undergraduate at University of North Carolina and we came out here on a field trip with a class and just seeing the diversity, you know, just what we've been talking about, all that diversity in one place and these amazing animals, it just blew my mind and I just, I became absolutely fixated. <laughs> and so, and that, that was it, you know. I mean, I really I can look back to that day and say that was the day that my life changed forever and that I was going to study lemurs and, you know, and ultimately Madagascar for the rest of my life. For more information about this story, including links to primary and popular literature and classroom resources, visit the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center website or the Understanding Evolution website. More stories are available in the Evolution in the News archives on either site. The National Evolutionary Synthesis Center is funded by the National Science Foundation to promote research in biological evolution. Music